Uh, thank you all for making time today to sharpen your saw with us. I see many familiar names in our participation. Some of you never missed these. Michael Washburn, my friend from Florida, likes it so much he's on here twice, apparently. Good to have you, Michael, all of you. Um, I am uh, talking to you today from, from uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. All is well here with uh, me and my family, but uh, unfortunately my aunt my mother's sister passed away last week at 97 years of age, uh, and the funeral is, well, basically happening now. So um, I was there earlier and have to head back. Uh, it's actually, it's too bad this isn't a Zoom call, because I'm, I'm sure I'm the best dressed one here. Uh, but uh, there, there are a couple of points that I just wanted to share with you, so I was glad I was able to get away and uh, at least open up the call. Um, I will be leaving you in quite capable hands. Uh, Lauren Defray, who sets all these calls up, is with us. Say hello, Lauren. Hello. And uh, so she'll be monitoring us through. And today's call is going to be emceed by none other than Todd Liss. Um, Todd's part of our, our steering committee. We've got a, a group now with Jason Josie of Georgia and John McClellan, uh, Minnesota DOT, who basically guide, uh, guide this entire organization with uh, the technical information. Lauren and I are not experts in safety service patrol or transportation safety, and we don't pretend to be. Uh, that's why we need all of you. We need these guys that, that help us, but we also need your participation, both during the calls, uh, in surveys. Uh, we'll have a survey at the end asking you what the next topic should be. That's how this topic got chosen. So I definitely want you all to uh, feel free to add in your information and ask questions as we go through. How? Uh, the calls were basically started to be a, 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 a forum of best practices. And that's really where we've tried to keep them. Um, we come up with the topics most of you know. We'll try to bring experts from around the country when we can. Uh, and that includes all of you to talk about how you handle that topic. Um, these calls right now are open to SSP managers and FHWA division administrators. There's a few others that wanted to get involved, uh, individual drivers, uh, some of the uh, oper patrol operators. And at this point, we're keeping it fairly close to the vest here with uh, either state or toll road authority SSP managers. And of course, FHWA joins as well. Uh, it's all done out of safehighways.org. If you haven't been to that website, I encourage you to go there. We continue to add information. You'll see some of that in a minute. Uh, and make sure we have your address. If you've received this invite from somebody else today, let's fix that going forward. Just send a note to SSP at safehighways.org. Lauren or someone just like her will get that and uh, make sure you're on our mailing list going forward. Lauren, what if they want to talk to us? Thank you, Sam. So as of right now, everyone is currently on mute. If you would like to mute, um, you would just select the unmute audio button. We please ask that you don't place the call on hold. It will give us a dial tone. If you do have to hop off, you can log back in. If you are dialing in through the phone, please make sure your computer microphone and speakers are turned off to avoid additional feedback. Throughout the session, there will be two polling questions that appear on your screen. If you can please complete those throughout the session, that is greatly appreciated. As I mentioned before, when we first signed in, we have um, two ways you can sign in through the chat box, or we also have a poll up on the screen for you to enter your title, organization, and email. Throughout this call, if you have any questions, you can um, contact at the uh, safehighways.org support team through the chat box. And after this call, the presentation will be available to download on the safehighways.org website. Throughout this call, um, each presenter is going to do their session, and at the end, we'll open it up to questions. Um, therefore, we do encourage everyone to have um, discussion and ask questions throughout the session. If you are on the webinar, you can raise your hand to ask a question, um, and we will unmute you and you can speak away. You also have the option to unmute by pressing star and pound for those of you that are dialed in through the phone, or if you would rather just 
ask a question in the chat box, you can do that as well, and one of the safehighway.org support team will speak up. If you are on the phone, just wait for a, a brief pause after you select the pound, uh, star and pound sign. Um, it will let you know that you've been unmuted, and then you can ask away. And that being said, I will pass it back to Sam. Thanks, Lauren. And, and we really do want your participation in all ways as part of this. I really enjoyed the uh, Zoom calls that we had. Um, I think most of you were part of that in April and May. But I just love the, the, the interaction and the feedback from everyone on those calls. Everybody got to speak up. So I'm hoping that carries over into this. Even though it's a different format with a webinar and such, we still have plenty of ways for you all to get to get involved. So there's chat rooms, as she said, raise your hand, et cetera. When we were, another example of that, I guess, we were contemplating in, in May, uh, do we do another COVID session? Do we need another one? Um, and so we sent a survey around. Only 14 patrols answered, but thank you. Um, but the answers were very consistent. Really, everything that you have been doing for COVID-19 is still in place. There's a little list here. Um, and it doesn't seem like there's been a lot of uh, changes or additions uh, over the past couple of months. So we felt that we didn't need to touch on that subject again, but we appreciate those who responded to our survey and gave us that pretty much uh, that direction of which way to go with this. So uh, one thing we do know, though, that has come uh, out of COVID is, is a serious concern, and that is the economic impact it's having on all transportation budgets. Uh, you see the Kentucky Patrol there, uh, beautiful patrol, covered the state. Uh, it's gone now. It got defunded primarily because of concerns with the, the budget. They have, they're looking for places to cut. And as many of you may, may be aware, a lot of times the people making these decisions don't know what your patrol really does. They see maybe in their drive home, you're helping motorists on the side of the road, and sometimes it's a legislative body making that budget decision, and they're wondering why are we paying to change people's tires. That's on all of us. It's our job to promote the vital nature of what SSPs do. Because I do this for a living, maybe the same thing happens to all of you. You're, you're, you're at a party or meeting people, and they ask what you do for a living, and I ask them, do you know about those, these patrols, these trucks that go around, and usually people don't. So the General Motors still doesn't know our organization, our, our industry exists. And I think somewhat the same is true with legislators and maybe even within your own ranks there up at the top where they're making budget decisions. They may not know how vital the work is that you're all doing. So we're strongly encouraging everybody in this call to be proactive. Promote your patrol now so you don't become, as Kentucky got uh, shorted uh, on a, some budget meeting that apparently they weren't even involved in. Um, We've put some, some resources on safehighways.org to kind of walk you through it. I think there's a photo of one here just giving you some ideas of things you should look at or promote. Um, there's a lot of uh, maybe in your own state you have a, um, a cost-to-benefit ratio study, but there's a lot that's been done in the industry. Uh, many of them are old, but some of that information is the type of thing I'm strongly encouraging everybody on this call to make sure that your upline knows how vital the, the program is. You may not be uh, in the meeting when they're talking about you, so uh, I suggest you do it in advance. There's one state, uh, Scott Yinger, if, if you can join us on the call. Scott's uh, from Maryland, SHA. He's spoken on these calls many times and helped us a lot. But uh, Scott's group has done an excellent uh, survey or resource working with uh, Maryland, University of Maryland. So Scott, can you talk a bit about that and how that might help you and the others on this call uh, proactively promote the programs? So thanks, Sam. I certainly can. And first and foremost, condolences to you and your family uh, in regards to your aunt. You certainly are blessed to have had her as long as you had. So uh, my Thank best you. to you and your family. That. So uh, we had a visionary uh, that started the chart program probably 30 years ago. So it's never too late, I'll tell you that. So even if you haven't started this, uh, data tells us everything. But 30 years ago, a gentleman named Hal Kassoff had the vision to uh, plug in our uh, Institution of Higher Learning in Maryland, the University of Maryland School of Engineering, and they developed the Center for Advanced Transportation Technology, the CAT Lab. And through that School of Engineering, 
Uh, we, we also are one of their sponsors, so we contribute funds to keep this moving annually. Uh, one thing that they do is, is analyze our data every year, uh, and they give us a comprehensive report probably halfway through the next calendar year that we can review to see how we're doing and how this program functions. Uh, what that allows us to do is, is actually uh, we fall under now some 80-20 federal funding because it seems to fit what the feds are looking for with efficiencies on the roadways. So that helps us where our state budget has recently been cut due to the COVID expenditures by 30%. We have yet to see any funding cut from the Fed at this point. So it does help us. Uh, what the University of Maryland does is take our data from chart and they do a lot of extrapolation, so it is a rather lengthy, very technical report. But they, they really look at the, the closure duration when chart is on the scene versus when chart is not on the scene. And they see the time savings of, and it's minutes, the time savings, average time savings, times the number of incidents that qualify that they deem statistically qualifying for that. And they determine uh, through the CORSIM, uh, a traffic simulation program produced by Federal Highway, they use that to estimate the direct benefits attributed to the de delay reduction of what CHART and the Traffic Incident Management Team here in Maryland is able to do. So uh, at our peak, I'm going to say probably two years ago, 2017, uh, the CHART program uh, was deemed by the University of Maryland to have saved the Maryland taxpayer almost $1.5 billion. Uh, and, and so that was at that point with how much it cost to run the chart program versus the benefit deemed by University of Maryland. And again, a third party, not, not our program saying we're doing well, but a third party academic program, uh, the cost to benefit ratio was 43 to 1. So for every dollar spent on the chart program, it was deemed that we saved the Maryland taxpayer $43. Now I'll say that that's not the primary use of the program, the primary benefit. The primary benefit is the safety of those people that are out there on the street uh, doing their job and making sure that everybody goes home at night in at least as good a condition as when they went to work. But in these economic times, when it becomes uh, competitive as to who's going to get what funding. Uh, I can't think of another program in Maryland that has a benefit to cost ratio near as high as what CHART does. And over and above that becomes the customer service approach to this. You know, it's the customer feedback that we get that says, you know, these folks out here with their boots on the street that are changing tires, yes, getting people off the shoulder before they got hit. And just on Saturday, we had a tow truck, not one of ours, private tow truck loading a car on the shoulder, not in the roadway, that was struck by a gentleman who veered off the road and, and the uh, tow truck operator was put in shock trauma. So this, this is happening. That customer service is there. We need to get those cars off the shoulder. We need to explain that to our legislators, our, our executive leadership in, in government that's going to decide where funding goes and let them know there's a cost benefit to opening lanes. There's a benefit to getting cars off the shoulders. Uh, and, and it's real dollars. So that's some of the stuff we've done. I will include in the chat room uh, a link to our reading room where I think since 2007 these annual analysis are provided. You're certainly welcome to download those. It's public information. Share that around if you'd like to get some ideas to see if that's something that can help your program in your particular jurisdiction. Thank you so much, Scott, for sharing that. And even though it's not about your specific patrol, I've seen the data. I think it's transferable. Uh, it's recent. It's thorough. So uh, I would grab it if I were in your position and uh, say these are what the, our, our, these are the type of things our patrol is producing. So uh, thank you all. I'm going to need to take my leave now, but I'm going to uh, bring on uh, Todd Lease. Todd, are you with us? Yes, I am, Sam. Thanks. All right. Take care. God bless. Thanks, Sam. So uh, before we get started here, I want to just do a, a in memory of uh, for some of the fallen operators that had in July was was a very uh, depressing month for for emergency responders. Eight emergency responders were struck during the 
from July 1st to July 30th. Uh, these are some of the, the, the responders. Uh, Ramon from Groups Towing was functioning as a safety service patrol operator, freeway service patrol operator in Wisconsin. Mark Alarcon worked for a towing company, but he was functioning as a Bay Area freeway service patrol operator when he was hit. And also John Holcomb, he was a volunteer, 70 years old, and was volunteering as part of their Metro Area Motorist Assist Program. Uh, he was a volunteer since 2014 and uh, served many, many hours, uh, thousands of hours, uh, providing emergency uh, roadside assistance for people. Uh, Tyler Ludensbach was actually one of my towers on the on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Uh, he was struck and killed at Interstate 70 uh, on July 21st, five hours after Tyler was killed. Eric Ackerman was killed on the Ohio Turnpike, uh, was struck and killed. You know, we need to keep that uh, their memories alive, first of all, but we need to also uh, work to try to ensure that no other responders are, are struck and killed. 30 responders have been struck and killed in 2020 so far. 12 law enforcement officers, 12 towers, three fire and EMS workers, and three safety service patrol operators are the numbers. Uh, last year, there was 44 emergency responders. This information is on respondersafety.com. If you look on respondersafety.com, uh, you could find that information as well with the, with the latest up-to-date information and, and numbers. There's also a map, an interactive map on respondersafety.com uh, that shows you where these responders have been struck and, and killed over the past five years in this country. So uh, if you have any responders that have been struck and killed, if you look at that map and you see somebody that's not on that map, please reach out to me, has my email address on that page, and let me know, and I will update the map as soon as possible. Uh, there's also 38 training modules free on that page, so if you do not know what respondersafety.com is, please go to that training. Jack Sullivan, who's the director of training for respondersafety.com, is on this call. Uh, I am I serve as Jack's assistant director of training uh, for respondersafety.com. It's something I definitely believe in, so we have to keep working uh, so that we don't have any more responders uh, struck and killed, struck and injured. So, uh, you know, now that uh, got everybody bummed out here and, and talked about the struck by, let's talk about some uh, Hoosier uh, hero helpers. It's my pr uh, privilege to uh, introduce John McGregor. John's going to talk about uh, what they do at INDOT and talk about uh, what Luis did here. Go ahead, John. Uh, sure. Um, good afternoon. Um, we had an event um, in early July where uh, Luis Flores, one of our freeway service patrol incident response technicians, uh, was assisting a motorist on Interstate 465 on the south side of Indianapolis. Um, it was just a standard assist, and another motorist came up behind him, and Luis kind of thought he was going to get at least his truck hit, but he quickly assessed the situation. The motorist came to a stop, and uh, that's what was going on. And it uh, turned out this motorist had been shot. Um, the bad news of the situation is ultimately the motorist um, did pass from the shooting, and a horrible event. But we celebrate Luis's actions. Um, Indiana State Police confirmed when they arrived on the scene that um, Luis was an absolute soldier. Um, he worked to stop the bleeding. He um, then, you know, administered CPR for approximately nine minutes till the emergency responders arrived. It was it was definitely a heroic action um, you know and this is just a kind of a salute to the training that um, this program um, provided him um, the professionalism how they conduct themselves and you know when the situation was was real Luis responded admirably so we're all very proud of him um, I believe he is on the call he is on the call with um, Roy McMillan I don't know who signed in but um, he's in his supervisor, his manager's office, Roy. I don't know if it would be appropriate to just let him comment as well, but, again, we're just very proud of him. Yeah, definitely, Luis. Uh, feel free to say whatever you, you'd like to. Be glad, very glad to hear from you.
give me a few minutes. Okay, we'll come back to Luis. If, if he wants to say anything, just make sure, you know, just sign in the chat box and we'll make sure uh, we do that here uh, as we go. Uh, next up is going to be our, our good friend, uh, Becky Gibson from New York State uh, DOT, talking about uh, their program and some highlights from their programs. Uh, uh, Becky, are you able to control your slides? Yes, I am. Thanks, Todd. Um, so I, I guess I don't have anything uh, quite as amazing as Luisa's story with uh, a driver being shot. But in New York lately, it seems we've had a bit of a, a rash of our help highway emergency local patrol drivers um, doing some heroic efforts. Um, the first two that I have shown on this um, are, are things that don't happen every day, but they do happen periodically. The first story, uh, one of our drivers was doing his turnaround on his parkway beat, and he happened to notice two young children on the side of the road, probably teenage, um, and for whatever reason, something in his head said that he needed to stop and see if they needed help. And it turns out the two kids were waiting for an ambulance because their friend had been injured on a nearby trail riding his bike. So they had already called the ambulance. They had already called the child's father. Um, but this help driver decided he needed to stop and he needed to wait just to make sure that the ambulance arrived um, and the child was taken care of. So he did that. He sent the kids back to uh, the, the young child that had been injured with some water to make sure that he wasn't getting dehydrated on a hot day. And he waited for EMS. And when they came, he decided to move on to the next, uh, the next patrol. And you know, before he left, he left the family a little note on their vehicle, because at that point, the father had arrived. And what I noted about that wasn't necessarily that he did anything amazing or spectacular, um, or it was really just beyond the call of duty, because these, these children weren't in a car, they weren't disabled vehicle, but he realized something in his, his mind told him that they needed help. Um, one of the other things we've noticed an increase of is some drunk driving arrests. We've had a couple different help drivers, uh, one down on Long Island, one in our Hudson Valley region who have noticed drivers driving erratically and they'll call the police and they'll do what they can to make sure that the police find a way to get these people off the road. So we do have uh, some things pending with these guys. And the last one I'm going to make note of, it's not written here because I think we're working on, on some sort of press event down on Long Island but we had a help operator stop to assist a disabled vehicle. There were two people there. Um, one of the people was above the vehicle looking into the engine. The other one had removed a tire and had the car up on the jack, and he was underneath the vehicle, and they happened to be changing a belt on the vehicle. And while the man was underneath the vehicle, the car fell off the jack. The rotor of the tire actually landed on the man and our help driver jumped into action and um, was able to jack up the car, and they were able to save this man's life. Um, all of these incidents are not incidents that we ever hear about from the driver. They're incidents that we hear about from either the public or from the police officers that actually assist um, as needed with uh, these events. So um, I do want to point out that it's never the driver that that's tooting his own horn, it's always somebody else that, that we find that is telling us about the amazing job. So some of the key takeaways that I have from these are help operators. They've been doing this for a long time. Um, they've really become very good at noticing when something doesn't seem right. If a vehicle isn't driving right and, you know, maybe they need to call police because they're drunk or even the two kids on the side of the road. One of the best trainings that um, they seem to use, and, and Luis did that in Indiana, is their first aid training. Um, they're always ready to jump into first aid mode when it's necessary and uh, have been known to save numerous lives. So these are just a couple of, of the examples that we have. And they can always think on their feet. Um, I, I find it amazing. Even 
the gentleman on our Taconic Parkway who thought to stop for the two children and said, you know, here, bring him some water. I'm going to wait. Um, you know, it's one of the things that, that they're best at is figuring out in a stressful situation what needs to be done. So, you know, one of my best practices has become taking a look at these um, assist patrol responses from the public to see if I can find some of these gems within the comments that the public makes so I can um, send those to the drivers, so I can send those to our public information officer, so I can send them to our executive management just to let them know what a great job and how amazing that these drivers really are. So that's all I have, Todd. No, sir. Thanks, Becky. I'm not sure what uh, everybody heard. I had take myself off mute, but it just got the uh, told me I was back off mute. So, uh, our safety service girls do a, a great job. So we, you know, got to make sure that we look for the again, like those gems that Becky mentioned, uh, and and thank them for the job that they do. They're out there facing dangers every day uh, that they're working. Uh, so sometimes just a attaboy or, or great job uh, goes a long way there as well. Uh, so we're going to get into today's topic uh, to keep things rolling. We have a poll question that we're going to answer. We're going to ask people, uh, how has your has your patrol held any introductory meeting with other emergency responders? Do they go out regularly and, and talk to the responders and, and uh, make those connections and try to bridge that gap? Uh, there and, and uh, you know it's all about teamwork it's all about partnerships when we do this so this webinar is going to focus on uh, what uh, what are some of the best practices that for emergency responders to deal with managing competing priorities at an emergency scene uh, methods for training and communications uh, initial introduction to safety service to fellow responders how do you react with them how do you get uh, in touch with them and then also the perspective from the uh, police fire EMS and towing professionals. So we have four great speakers uh, that are going to help us out that we reached out to, to to give us a little bit of their perspective from uh, their industry. So the first speaker that we're going to have up here is Lada Nall, uh, formerly of, of Nall's Towing. I, I've known Lada for a number of years. He's helped me out uh, a lot of times, and uh, he understands what we as a transportation professional was looking for uh, from a store, and that's communications when they get on the scene and, and being able to work together and let us know what we, uh, not what we think we want to hear, but what we need to hear a lot of times. And understand the, the safe, quick clearance uh, process. If you haven't voted, if you if you want to go ahead and vote, we have about uh, less than 30 people that, that voted so far out of about 100 people that are on the phone. So uh, we'll leave the poll question open up a little bit, but a lot of you want to get started here. Uh, and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how we can work better with those. Sure. Um, so I've been uh, been running a tow truck for about 20 years. I've also been involved with the fire department for 20 years, so I can speak, you know, both both sides of the equation when, you know, get on scene as far as what's going on. Um, in our area, we don't have any real major highways, so we don't get to interact with safety service patrol out nearly as much as I think would be beneficial. Um, but, you know, the biggest thing, and, and we see it from getting calls from, you know, the various police departments that we would service, um, you know, county radio and all that, a lot of the times we're not really sure what we're getting into. So um, when – what I, what I told Todd when I was first asked to do this is, you know, not all towing companies are created equal. So it's really up to the, the safety service patrol, you know, operators and supervisors to go out and, you know, shake hands and meet these people face-to-face, -face, you know, at their location, you know, when, when you got time to talk and not, you know, let's hurry up and get the road open. Um, you know, get, get to walk through their yard, get to see all the tools they have, you know, and that way, you know, hopefully when you show up on scene and it's something out of the ordinary, you know, you, you might have in the back of your mind, well, I know these guys have this, you know, back in the corner, and maybe 
you know, maybe they're the right call for the job, you know, maybe we should tell them that this is what we have, try to make sure they get the right equipment out there the first time. Um, you know, one of the one of the incidents we reviewed for the turnpike was that, um, you know, a crash where the, the tow was just called and said, hey, you know, we, we need you to come out with two heavy duty tow trucks. And that was really all the information they got. Um, you know, and then they got there and like, oh, well, we, you know, it, had they brought, you know, some more specialized equipment with them, they would have been able to get the scene cleared, you know, a lot quicker. But by the time their, you know, their first guy got there, he went to the truck around so they could get a lane open. But then they had lost the ability to run traffic, you know, to, to run their tow truck down the opposite direction on the road to get to the accident as quickly as possible. Um, you know, just there's a lot of times that being able to get the right information to the towers, you know, right off the bat would save a lot of time later on down the road. And also, you know, how many of your towing contractors in your various locations either have been or are required to go through Tim training? You know, it's something that isn't, it, at least in our area, is not required by any of the, the contracts that we service. So it's definitely something to consider. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, in, in this day and age, you know, I mean, we're all utilizing technology here right now, but that doesn't seem like something that's getting utilized a whole lot out on the scenes. Um, you know, it, it really would be great to be able to, to have pictures, you know, or even a video conference from the SSP operator, you know, when we get, you know, would get notified to, to respond that we can see exactly what we have to go out to and know all, you know, is there other stuff we can bring with us? Um, you know, what, are there any special circumstances that are there that we're gonna to need to contend with? Um, you know, has the vehicle caught fire? Can it be hooked to and towed? Does it need to be hauled off the scene? You know, how tall is the vehicle? You know, that that's gonna depend on, you know, can we just pick it up and set it up on a land all or do we need to do something you know, even crazier to get it off the road because, you know, if you have a vehicle that's already at legal height and you pick it up and set it up on a trailer, now we don't have the ability to go down the road with it because, you know, especially up here in the Northeast, you know, bridges are not real forgiving on oversized loads and then we've just created another problem just a little bit further down the road. Uh, next slide, please. So this incident uh, took place on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. The, uh, in, in the pictures, you can see the wheel loader, the skid loader, and uh, there was also a mini excavator on scene that all belonged to the towing contractor. That was not uh, Turnpike equipment that was brought out. So I mean, that's you know specialized stuff that not every towing company has, but they're also not gonna bring it out unless they know that you need it out there. So that's where getting, you know, good and proper information, you know, as far as, you know, how badly it was burning. Mean, obviously, in this case, the truck and trailer were a total loss. So it was, you know, they, they wound up eventually getting the right equipment out to the job, but had they had pictures of the scene, you know, what was going on as soon as they were called, they might have been able to get, you know, stuff out there quicker. And, you know, Todd has these statistics memorized, and I'm sure he can rattle them off, but, you know, every minute that we're out there, you know, the chances of a... Uh, secondary collision increases by like 2%. So being able to get the right equipment out as quickly as possible, you know, certainly mitigates that and gets everybody home quicker and safer. Um, so it's just, it's nice to know, you know, if the SSP can get in touch with the towing company directly or have their number, you know, relayed so that the tower does have questions, you know, especially on these larger commercial incidents that they can call ahead you know, try to get a better understanding of, you know, what are the vehicles involved? How are they damaged? How many of them are there? You know, what is the best route to come in? Is traffic definitely stopped and they can approach the wrong way or do they have traffic flowing and they need to come in from the other direction? Um, 
and the more you know the more you get out and get to talk to the towers the more you're going to you know appreciate their experiences their knowledge you know if they come to you and they say okay this is what we're going to do you know you'll be able to have a, a much better bond and, and trust with them to say okay you know i've seen your operation i know what you guys can do you know you have at it and and also don't be afraid to tell them you know what you can do or you know what other resources you might have um, just to be able to, to try and make sure that everybody's got a job to do when you get there and that it's not you know one guy does his thing and then we all stand around and wait until the next guy does his thing you know, if we can have everybody coordinated and just keep the ball rolling you know it gets everybody in and out and back home a lot quicker and a lot safer so that's all I got Todd have at it Thanks. Does anybody have any questions for Lada at this time? You can either uh, put them in the discussion question box or, or uh, go ahead here and uh, let us know. A couple points that Lada made there that, that I think was good, you know, again, communicate with your with your tower. Part of my responsibility as a turnpike is I, I manage the 112 fire companies, 67 ambulances, and 22 towers on the turnpike. And when I go out to an emergency incident, uh, the best thing that I like have happen is uh, whoever's in charge, whoever the, uh, the incident commander is or whoever my tow operator is, comes up to me and says, this is what my plan A is, this is what my plan B is, this is what my plan C is. And plan C is when uh, things don't go well and, and it, it, you know, pretty much worst case scenario. I could plan for plan C if you tell me it's going to be five or six hours uh, total. Uh, but if you keep telling me it's 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, that's hard to plan for. So. You know, rely on your experts at the scene and, and um, I guess, have the trust in those experts at the scene and listen to the experts. If they tell you they need to shut down a lane for 10 minutes uh, in order to, to pull something up and you don't want to give them that lane and, and now it takes them two hours for that recovery instead of giving them that 10, 10 minutes uh, to give them that lane, that sometimes uh, creates an issue for us. So. Uh, anybody have any questions? If not, we'll go on to the uh, our next uh, presenter. Okay, our next presenter is a, a good friend and somebody who's presented for me in, in some other forums and is always a great presenter. Um, Public Safety Director, uh, Fire Chief for Highland County, Florida, Mark Bayshore. Uh, is also the Executive Editor for Fire Rescue One and FireChief.com. Uh, previously was a Fire Chief in Prince George County, Maryland and also the emergency man manager for Mineral County, uh, West Virginia. And he now lives in uh, sunny Florida. Um, every day he posts his pictures on social media. It just makes you sick. Uh, but again, he says you don't have to shovel uh, sunshine. So uh, Mark, go ahead and uh, uh, please share your the fire perspective. Thanks, Todd. Uh, absolutely no shoveling uh, sunshine down here. Um, so for the folks on the line, uh, you know, I where I am now is in Central Florida, basically, about an hour and a half south of Orlando. We're an hour and a half to either coast. So we have the main highway coming through is Highway 27, which um, is a main evacuation route through the center of the state. Uh, so from that perspective, working with roadways, I currently work with that evacuation route as our primary and pretty much our only north-south road. In Prince George's County, when I worked there, which I spent uh, nearly 40 years in total there, uh, I-95 comes through the county and we knew working with the chart program in Maryland uh, and learning the different uh, elements of that, that 1.5% uh, of the country's gross national product goes up and down I-95 every day. So every time, and we used to reinforce this to our folks in fire and EMS and the rescue world, that every time we shut down I-95, we shut down 1.5% of the country's gross national product. So our folks understood it was important but they also understood they needed to be safe, and they were much more concerned about being safe than necessarily the, uh, the GMP, but that was part of what we taught them. Um, on this slide, uh, the picture that you see, I wanted to just touch on that for a second. That's what a building fire in Florida looks like with 40 mile an hour winds uh, up against a highway. Uh, that was a, a mobile home um, sales a facility that uh, burned just about six months ago and shut down. Now, that is the four-lane uh, evacuation route I was talking about. 
shut down that road for two and a half hours while we mitigated that problem. So, you know, I ask folks to make sure that as they enter into the relationships that you, you've heard about building, and I'm going to mention building here in a second again, understand who has the statutory authorities and responsibilities uh, in your agency. Who has EMS? You're going to hear from EMS in a, uh, after this presentation. Uh, you're going to hear a separate presentation. But in some places, it is the fire department. In some places, it's a third-party private entity. In some places, it's a county that has its own EMS agency not related to the fire uh, department. So you need to make sure you understand that coming in. Every state is different. Uh, in some places within the state, multiple counties and then cities are different about who provides it. It's very important to understand that so you understand building those relationships. Just because you go to the fire department, you may not be building that relationship with everybody that you need to be to hit that fire and rescue uh, perspective. So find out who has those, uh, work on building those relationships, understand that there are dynamic differences between the states and municipalities. Where I was in West Virginia when I was the emergency manager there, there were no paid anything in that county. No paid EMS, no paid fire. It was a completely volunteer system, which uh, probably two-thirds of the departments across the country are actually completely volunteer. Um, a lot of what I recognized from working, especially in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, the dysfunction gets worse the higher it gets. So we talk about um, our mission is to bring calm to chaos. That is our general mission overall. And uh, those of you that are, have been in the fire service know that sometimes there's a joke that uh, uh, that uh, chaos means the chief has arrived on scene, and if you take a minute and work through that, you'll understand. We cannot allow chaos to mean that we have arrived on the scene. Uh, what we saw in the D.C. area is that it was so quick that a lot of those different response agencies would show up. Uh, the dysfunction grew higher as people that showed up that thought they had responsibility, thought they had jurisdiction, thought they had authority, uh, got involved in our scenes, and we, we really had to work through the incident command system, which will be a slide in just a minute. I, I ask you to train on the incident command system if you don't already. Uh, FEMA requires the IS 2, uh, 100, 200, and then if you get further into it, 300, 400, of course, 700 and 800. Hopefully, you all have those uh, classes, and those are, um, those are things that you're constantly training on. Ensure that when you're doing the training, you, a lot of what uh, the Emergency Responder Safety Institute does is this interdisciplinary training and bringing all of us together so that it's not the first time that we're meeting when one of these big incidents like the picture on that slide shows up that we've trained together, we've met, we've, uh, you know, we've seen each other before. Prepare for those competing priorities as uh, all those different entities I showed up, that alphabet uh, soup I talked about shows up on your scene. Uh, you know, you need to be prepared for those competing priorities. Uh, there was a time on the Washington Beltway where a governor from one of the states showed up at an incident command post and ordered the fire chief to open the road so that the governor could get through. Uh, fortunately, the, the fire chief didn't do that. There are uh, at, least, at least two other stories I can tell you out of Maryland uh, from my time there where uh, fire chiefs were arrested by police agencies because they wouldn't open up a road. Uh, we, I hope we have come past that, but I know that there are places around the country where those types of things happen. So you need to be prepared for those competing priorities and make sure that you're doing everything you can. Uh, make sure that uh, the safety patrol operators have the appropriate radio systems to communicate with the fire department, and you understand their lingo. Uh, you know, you're, we're supposed to have plain language. Uh, a lot of the, the grant programs require plain language, but the reality is that there are still a lot of places that aren't using it, and I want to give you one example. Uh, this is a 1050. So I don't know what a 1050 means to you in your jurisdiction. But I can tell you where I am right here in Florida now, they still use some 10 codes, and a 1050 is a vehicle check in my county. So we need to check out this vehicle, so they'll call out a 1050. In Maryland, a 1050 was a vehicle accident. In West Virginia, where I worked, a 1050 was an officer in trouble. So three dynamically different things for the same 10 code, which is one of the reasons they were supposed to be going the plain language. So please understand what it is you're coming to. Make sure you have the radio systems uh, to, to work with your fire and rescue departments. Understand the concepts of command and control, accountability, and safety. A lot of times uh, we had an incident this morning with a truck with the pool chemicals on fire, and we had to shut down again that evacuation corridor, the entire corridor, while they dealt with the hazardous materials on that truck. 
a lot of the um, folks that wanted the road open right away didn't understand that we were dealing with four different chemicals that had to be cleaned up and the hazardous environment around that. So they were angry that the road was closed. And a lot of times uh, folks don't understand that accountability and safety issues that those people are going through. So make sure you have that and your folks understand it and they can help um, farther back where they're going to be that they can help uh, calm those fears and if, if it's rerouting get them off the road. The roles, responsibilities, and authorities, that's where the incident command system helps break that down and make sure that you're operating within your box. And then I'm going to talk about thinking outside the box, but stay in your lane. You've got to think about ways to get things done, but make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. So if there are ideas that you have to give to the incident command, there's a way to get those ideas there, but make sure you stay in your lane and you're doing what you need to do. Um, understand the concepts of command post management. We teach. Uh, that a command post is typically a fixed uh, place. That doesn't always happen everywhere, but we try to teach that that is a fixed place so that everybody knows where the command post is. Typically identified by a green flashing light or a green flag. I've begun teaching labor as a way for new incident commanders to and new officers to establish those command posts. And that's to find a location that's visible, and as my slides go back and forth, thank you, uh, to find a location that is uh, visible and that uh, can be seen by others, uh, to announce that location, to uh, establish a 10 by 10 box that you don't leave, that's your box, to observe what's going on so you hear those screeching tires coming from behind you, you hear someone screaming, and ultimately to relax. Because if you bring chaos to chaos, then it will just continue to beget chaos. And then remember, there's always uh, demobilization and the safety that has to go along with that. We teach people to get there, get done, and get out. This uh, slide talks about time, uh, distance, and shielding, which is the same thing we use for, uh, uh, for radioactive incidents. We teach people to limit their time on target, uh, in this case it's traffic, to increase the distance between themselves and the target, in this case, which is traffic, and to shield themselves with big stuff between the, themselves and the target, in this case, which is traffic. So time, distance, and shielding, limit your time on target, increase your distance between you and the target, and shield yourself with big stuff. We use the fire trucks. I don't like using million dollar fire trucks to block the road, but sometimes that's what I have to do, and ultimately, I can replace that million dollar fire truck. I can't replace that firefighter or rescue person. And then uh, uh, last couple of slides here, we uh, try to limit the number of people on scene to those that are necessary for us, and we ask everybody else to do the same thing. The fewer people we have there, the fewer people we put in harm's way. Have enough there to get the job done, but get the rest to, to be off doing what they need to be doing. Um, we want to make sure we're, everybody's using the uh, inside out lanes, so the, the fast lanes, lane one, and working to the right, and that those identifications are being used uh, by all of us. Not every fire department's up on that. We try to get the message out in all of our trainings, but we want to make sure that everybody's on that same page. Uh, we teach our people to, to be mindful of uh, and alert of their surroundings, that sight, smell, and sound, all of the things I talk about with the incident command post, make sure that uh, you know, something that doesn't smell right or look right probably isn't right. Uh, so th we, they have to be very attuned to those things as they're working on a scene. Uh, we hope that uh, by these kind of events that we all begin to understand each other's roles better and that that leads to better coordination on scenes, uh, that we rely on each other for the areas of expertise. My expertise is not in rerouting traffic. Uh, a lot of the folks on this call's expertise is not in putting out a hazardous materials fire. So we ask that we support each other and that we respect each other's roles and that expertise. And, uh, you know, I pledge to work with all of our uh, highway folks, and we do not have a safety patrol here in Central Florida, but uh, we do in other places in the state. Uh, ensure the communication systems are in place. I know that can be expensive, but those are things we have to do. We have to get past this thing of I don't have their radio or they're on VHF and I'm on a trunked uh, digital system, Every, we have got to fix that. Uh, and that's ultimately something that I hope some of that federal uh, dysfunction can find a way to fix. Um, and uh, be specific in terms when you're uh, on scene and you're talking about something, you, you show up with something, you guys know using uh, lane markers, using mile markers, those are things that help us uh, get to a scene. That hazmat call I talked about this morning 
was given at a, a, a landmark location that was actually a mile north of the actual scene of the incident. Fortunately, the fire trucks were coming from the south, so they came across it. Um, but it, we need people to be very specific with what they're doing. And then finally, for my part here, uh, dealing with hazardous materials on the highway, we ask you to look at placards and use the ERG. You, hopefully, you're carrying the emergency response guide with you. Communicate the information you find. If you find that code on the uh, placard, communicate that back so that our incident commanders and our fire folks can begin the process of identifying what that is. Um, when you come up on a tractor trailer that's involved in an accident, I have ingrained in myself and in our folks, they come up on a tractor trailer accident, the first question after they, they're looking at injuries, the, the next question is, what's in that truck? And just because there's not a placard doesn't necessarily mean there's not something bad in that truck. So helping us understand the known and the unknown is important. Understand we've got runoff and contamination issues to deal with and anticipate that that may mean lane closures for extended periods of time. That may mean rerouting because we have to put out uh, booms across uh, either a roadway, a waterway, or uh, a pile of sand to divert things. It, it just could mean all kinds of different things. Uh, and that rerouting, of course, causes lots of problems. And then the decontamination and demobilization is going to keep the road closed longer than your typical car fire or your typical fire and rescue incident. Uh, so that's what I have. I want to leave time then for EMS, and I appreciate you all uh, taking the time to listen today. Thanks, Mark. I had trouble getting off uh, mute there. Anybody have any questions for Mark? Uh, at this point, you can also write them in the chat box as well. Uh, I appreciate the, the information, Mark, and, and great job, like always. You know, one of the things uh, I want to mention about the hazmat is your responders, does your safety service patrols or your other responders carry flash or uh, binoculars uh, on their on the units, you know, you may not want to pull up to the scene, depending on what it is. If you see an overturned tanker or, or something, you may want to try to get those from a little bit of a distance. Um, so just some things to think about. Um, last call for questions for Mark. Uh, we'll move on, but if you, if you get something, uh, again, uh, we could do that. Uh, Mike Washburn had a question uh, for Lada. said, have you seen more recognition by law enforcement to stay on the scene until the tow is ready to go? Uh, are they... Uh, willing to stay there to, to help out a little bit more, do you think, or um, or what's your thoughts, Lada? So I, I was in the midst of typing up a long response, but I think it could be taken out of context. Um, the the police seem to, to understand what we're dealing with, and I think that, that there's been a great job made to bring awareness to the dangers of being out there alone, you know. I mean, fortunately, you know, most of the time when a trooper's conducting a traffic stop, he's able to park his car between him and and where he's doing his, his uh, police business at. Whereas, you know, when you're the tow truck, you know, whether it be a tow truck, rollback, whatever, you're typically up in front. You don't, you're not able to provide any advance warning to the people coming up behind you. You know, you don't have a big fire truck to park there to protect the scene. You know, you, you need to be up in front of it to be able to do your job. Um, yet that being said, unfortunately, out where we are, you know, law enforcement is already stretched very thin. So... You know, especially the, the Lancaster barracks of the Pennsylvania State Police. I know at night, any given night, they have two cars on to cover the entire county. Um, and that's, that's a lot of people. So, you know, and more often than not, you know, especially if they have a DUI or something, you know, their, their goal is to get, them, get that person in, check whatever. So I, I think there's been awareness made, but it's still a – a supply and demand issue. So, I mean, all, all we can really do is keep trying and hope that people don't take the defund police thing seriously. Thanks, Lada. Any other questions for Lada or, or, or Mark? Or otherwise, we'll continue on with, with uh, Scotty here. Okay, the, the next gentleman, uh, that's going to be presenting for us is Scotty Graham, and he's another one of our providers on the Turnpike Commission, uh, the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Uh, on the Turnpike, our safety service patrols, we have 28 different uh, safety service patrol 
locations across the turnpike. They cover 552 miles, and they are available 24-7, 365 as part of our, our turnpike. Uh, on the turnpike, our safety service patrols, or state farm patrol, is our eyes and ears. They're usually a, the first responder. They get dispatched for everything. Um, so uh, what, we, what I asked Scott to share today with us is uh, his experience that we had earlier this, this year uh, was a mass casualty incident that occurred in uh, January 5th, uh, 2020, uh, that, that he was the incident commander for. This made national news, so some of you may have heard about this incident. It was a uh, five-fatality uh, bus uh, that, uh, commuter bus that uh, was struck by a tractor trailer, caused five fatalities at the scene. It was a very uh, horrific scene, uh, probably one of the worst that I've seen in my career. Luckily, we had uh, Scott Graham and his team out there uh, that made this incident so much better. When I got to the scene, Scott he told me, this is what I have going on, this is what we did, this is what we're going to do. And it, and it was so much relief off of me knowing that we had somebody on the scene that was um, communicating and capable and willing to share and always have that open relationship. So uh, Scott's the fire chief and also EMS operations chief for Mutual Aid EMS. 42 years of fire and EMS experience. Uh, and as a fire EMS instructor, and also was the incident commander for our mass allergy incident. So, Scott, go ahead and take it away. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to echo some of Mark's uh, points. When working with EMS, you know, the, the time not to meet them is at 2.30 on a rainy morning uh, on a closed highway. Um, you need to be able to reach out and meet your local EMS. As Mark said, there's a variety of delivery of EMS across the nation. Uh, we happen to be a uh, third-party nonprofit uh, with no connection to the municipalities or the fire departments, even though we do work with them. So you, you need to get your EMS providers uh, brought in uh, ahead of the time. You know, once these meetings, once you have the initial meeting, uh, you're not over. You need to continue to meet with the EMS providers. Stay connected. People leave. Uh, people, you know, shift positions. You need to be able to have uh, a, a base so that you can communicate and so everybody knows um, who the players are. Um, you know, one of the things that we look at, we service three counties. Um, I, we need to be able to know what people have what their background is, what their training is, and what type of equipment they are. During these meetings, you also need to be able to establish your, your suggested operating guidelines. You need to educate the EMS providers on what it is that you're required to do or what you do, and in turn, then your EMS providers need to be able to do uh, the same thing in return. Here's, here's what we're bringing to the table. I am going to echo Mark again on communications. Communication is a key, whether it's on scene, pre or post incident. Uh, we need a radio, yes. You need to have a direct communications on the scene. Um, you need to have the proper language. Uh, in our instance, with the uh, bus wreck on a turnpike, we were actually able to marry the three counties together, and out of the 31 ambulances that uh, responded to this incident, there was only three that we could not talk to. Uh, they were on uh, a whole separate uh, communication system. I think that, that that worked very well, and that was a pre-established guideline that we had with the county to be able to use our i system. When working on scene with the MS, you need to every, you need to have a unified command structure. As Todd said, when he pulled in, we'd already established a, a unified command system: uh, towing, turnpike, fire, EMS, police, um, re the recovery service. Everybody was in one place, and we did not make a move without everybody in that command post, which was nothing more than leaning on a jersey barrier. No move was made unless it was okayed through that command post, and we had representatives there. That's a must. You have to have input. Um, 
you know, make sure that then your responders know where the command post is, know who the, the people are that are within that command post, and then understand their role uh, of who they uh, go to. You know, if they're, they would go to a section leader or, the, or you know, to a uh, chief, these guys need to be educated on the incident command system ahead of time. One of the, another one of the things that we did, which was apparently um, a little out of the ordinary, was we had completed search and rescue on the uh, accident several times. And then we decided we were going to do one last uh, clear sweep of, of the accident scene. We included the, the uh, turnpike uh, maintenance guys. We including, uh, included towing, EMS, the fire. You know, there's things that towing may see that we don't even know that's a hazard. Same way with the, the turnpike maintenance. Uh, these guys, we worked together as one team. We went throughout the, the, the accident itself, uh, you know, doing our final search and rescue and come out. Um, one of the things that you need to maintain and make sure that you maintain with your SSPs and with everybody involved, these folks, a lot of these accidents can be horrific. Um, you need to get the CISM into these folks. You need to get them entered into the system. We have a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, where it's our own folks that will uh, come out and you know assess each one of the responders. These folks also need to get into the into rehab and work cycles. Uh, you know the incident on the turnpike, the bus crash. Uh, we were there somewhere around 14 hours. Uh, you're not going to be able to work all that time. So you need, we got into work cycles. We got people pushed through rehab. We had a uh, uh, EMS chaplain that came out and spoke to these fo uh, folks as well. Um, we talked a little bit about the scene search and rescue and secure access points. Those are all things that need to be done in conjunction with each other. Uh, at the end of our incident, when we, even though we had completed uh, search and rescue, uh, I think it was up to four times, when the when the tower came in and everybody command post said yes, we we're going to start moving vehicles. We did it as a team, so they would move a vehicle, it would be searched again, it would be cleared by fire, cleared by EMS, cleared by turnpike. For the tower and to take it away. It is team effort. You have to collaborate, communicate, and be safe no matter what you're doing. One of the things that the turnpike did for us on that accident was clear the black, uh, backlog so that we were able to get additional resources in. We were moving uh, with permission and with coordination. We were moving units uh, in opposite directions uh, in the opposite lane of travel. Uh, once these guys cleared the backlog, we were actually able to get other units in from the uh, from the east. We as medical professionals need to make sure that uh, everybody is safe on the scene. The SSPs, the, the maintenance workers, the police, fire. Um, so what we have adopted is, again, when you go into rehab, folks are going to come up and start talking to you and make sure that you're mentally okay, that you're physically okay, see what uh, certain needs are. Everybody that's on that scene needs to participate. Uh, we did find, one of the things I will tell you is we did find after the incident, we had several folks that had uh, problems because of, of responding onto the incident, and we did get them into the, into the CISM system, and everything worked out very well. The other thing that I would encourage you to do, and this is not with just EMS, this is with everybody. After an incident that is a major incident, you need to sit down and come up with an after action review. We sat down with uh, Todd and the folks from Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission and held an after action review. And we, uh, each one of us made a checklist, hey, we could do this differently, we could do this differently. This worked out well, we need to change our policy to include that. You need to make sure, again, communication. After the incident, make sure that you sit down and look. It doesn't have to be a major incident either. You have a, a single, single vehicle accident, a couple things didn't go right. 
sit the players down so that, that everybody in the end comes off of the same page. Uh, one of the things that I can tell you that we're still dealing with uh, a lot of the investigation portion of the PA Turnpike. Um, you know, I, I talked to NTSB here not too long ago. Um, everybody that was involved in the incident, EMS Fire, Police, um, Turn Recovery, SSPs, everybody that was on that incident was uh, interviewed by NTSB for some form of information. So you just need to be prepared with that. And that's all I have, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate the information. Anybody, any questions for Scott? A couple points that, that uh, about that incident. Again, we have an after-crash review report that's available for anybody that wishes to see it. It's a public document. We bring all the players to the table that were involved in that incident, and uh, we met virtually due to the COVID situation, but it went quite well. I think the overall, uh, you know, uh, you know, we're looking to, to make improvements to the process. So at the Turnpike, uh, we regularly do after action reviews, and we make these reports available. Uh, we, we do a printed report. We make them available. So any of these that we have, uh, we're willing to share them out there and, and to discuss them closer uh, with anybody. Our safety service patrol was the first person on the scene for this bus crash, and so we immediately had somebody on the scene that could start providing uh, information to EMS and, and to the other responders. And we're on a common, like Scott talked about, we're on a common radio frequency so everybody could uh, discuss what was going on. Uh, something that happened during this incident that, uh, that affected the incident a little bit here uh, was the fact that about 50 miles away on Interstate 70, uh, there was a paramedic uh, that was struck and, and killed. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, he's the first responder killed. He was killed about 5 a.m. of this incident, so about an hour and a half into the incident. This was the same county 911 center that was working both incidents. Uh, so now you have a mass cavalry crash that you have once in your career. Now you also have a, a, a another uh, mercy responder that, that was struck and killed. Uh, so you're dealing with them, and, and it's somebody that you knew personally. So uh, a great thing uh, that we could would share with you is the fact that, you know, what Scott said, make sure that everybody at the scene has access to, to SISM or some uh, critical instance stress debriefing. It was nice to have those pastors at the scene. Uh, make sure that if you have a mass fatality like this, uh, that the bodies are covered up. We didn't do that real well. That's one of the things that came out of our after action review. Uh, so we want to make sure that we do that. And talk to your responders and talk to your uh, safety service patrol and decide what his role is at, at the scene. Does he go to the scene first and, and be your first responder? And then does he back away then and later on become your uh, the person providing the early warning? So understand what your role is and make sure that that's clearly communicated with everybody as well. Uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, very uh, excited to, to hear him speak is, is Derek Arnson uh, with the Arizona Department of Transportation. He was a previous police chief uh, with the Dallas Police Department and is a great resource and a, and a uh, great uh, member for the, the traffic operation, the traffic incident management group. So uh, Derek, go ahead and take it away. Bob, oh, thank you. Uh, you're very kind. I, I'm excited to be with this group. I recognize the audience is uh, mostly pretty, se pretty seasoned uh, professionals in this, in this uh, audience. So I want to keep my remarks to <clears throat> my experience having a, a newly uh, up and running what we call instant response unit, which you would consider uh, an SSP. We started in October of 2019 and uh, we've received some rave reviews so far, and I feel like we've done a, a really good job, the team. It's managed by uh, a former chief of police, also by the name of Mark Brown, who's come in and done a, a fantastic job. But um, I also um, echo, um, Todd, what you had said in um, respondersafety.com. We, in fact, I need to get my, my fallen uh, <clears throat> instant responder on that uh, on that list. Frank DiRizio, we lost Frank, an incredible member of our team back in March. 
uh, struck by. Um, again, we look at those percentages uh, as, the, as the one minutes to 10 minutes to 15 minutes keep ticking on our timeline of traffic incident management. Those odds stack quickly against us. And unfortunately, Frank was doing his job. He was doing everything right and still lost his life to uh, an individual that wasn't paying attention. Um, with that being said, I want to I want to talk about my experience. I've I've I did a career with our state patrol, and uh, was blessed to have many wonderful experiences with the uh, men and women that work there. Um, <clears throat> and then I've been about seven years uh, in municipal law enforcement at the capacity of the chief of police and a couple of uh, law enforcement agencies. And so I want to I want to share just my view, maybe that might enlighten some of you. Um, as to local law enforcement and state patrols or highway patrols, um, departments of public safety and the states that might have them called that. But <clears throat> I think there's a little bit of a difference. I've, I've found that my experience as a municipal police officer is that my officers are very capable and experienced in a multiplicity of things. One of those is not accident investigation and crash investigation. The flip side to that is the troopers that are out there on the highways are highly skilled at investigating accidents. They understand the dynamics and the chain of events that are associated there. What the missing link is, is that, <clears throat> and where the, I will say the, uh, the commonality of putting those two together is the crime scene. In law enforcement, and I will certainly say I was one of those that did this before I was able to put the full helmet and hat of uh, responsibilities I have now as overseeing one of which is the, the, our safety service patrols or our incident response unit. And that is that we sometimes have a, a just a, our lens is just very specific. We want to control the crime scene. We want to preserve evidence. We want to make that scene safe. And what we over, overlook sometimes because of that uh, zealousness to be proactive in preserving that evidence and keeping that crime scene what it needs to be is we forget about what that's happening to that queue and that line of traffic that we're um, trying to detour or, or send away from us. And I think the efforts of Tim, the traffic incident management training, is probably one of the most critical components to give us an opportunity to be better, to, to improve where we are in, in, our, in our standards of operating and as well as improving our safety. And I find that uh, even now, driving by scenes, whether it be on the highways or whether it be in local municipalities, that there's, there's still a lot to do on the law enforcement side of getting those, those officers, that law enforcement element, uh, trained up in TIM. Um, I think what we did um, was to advance our opportunities. As I say, we started up our program in October of last year. Um, I have had the, the blessing of knowing the higher-ups in, uh, in our state patrol. And so I was able to quickly put together meetings and let them know what was coming forth. Um, and they were excited. They knew that this element of additional about 15 um, operators were going to give them more opportunities. And again, let me just clarify, I oversee all of the state. But in this particular instance, I'm giving you just the metropolitan Phoenix area because that's where we're staffed with this instant response unit. It is not a statewide unit. It is just in the metropolitan area. And we do have a safety service patrol um, under the state patrol. And we are one of, I think, one, maybe two other states, um, unlike you guys on the phone, that um, you either have them under your DOT or they're a, th they're a third party. And uh, that could have been a great challenge for me. But again, blessed with having done a career with DPS. Um, I was able to mitigate that and show that we can work together. And what we did was we came together. We actually trained. We went out. Um, we, we, through our TIM training, we were able to pr pull troopers in, pull our tow, tow and recovery people in, and pull our DOT people in, as well as our new instant responders, and have a really good opportunity to train and talk. And uh, that kind of broke the, the, I guess, the, the misinformation that was kind of getting out there that this new group of the new DOT is going to maybe overtake the uh, state's uh, safety service patrols. And that I wanted to make sure that they knew that 
their 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 unit was not in jeopardy of being lost. It was only going to be supported. As a former law enforcement uh, person, I know the importance of being able to have your officers proactive um, and be able to, to respond to things that, that law enforcement does. And the quicker my team could, could make that uh, process better and improve those, those opportunities, um, I knew that I was going to have a greater opportunity of being successful giving that. So basically our guys are able to have, an, have some more uh, I guess boots on the ground, if you will, to be able to improve DPS's responses. So when you have a broken down motorist, they don't need to respond to that as they as much as they did, um, because our guys will handle that. If there's debris in the road, we have a way of, of clearing that. Just like George has done an incredible job over the many many years in Maryland and 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 Pennsylvania. And I could just go on. The list is 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 pretty exhaustive. But the opportunities to to speak to and talk to law enforcement over a period of the last almost a year now um, has been pretty refreshing. And um, I can tell you that you find, as you all know, there's, there's a very, uh, I guess it's an alpha characteristic or design in, in most of these responders. And that's a good thing um, because they're, they're able to understand what their discipline is and be strong in that to support that and push that. But I, I've heard from all of these uh, presenters about the unified command structure and the value of ICS. And again, back to going back, going back to the, the TIM uh, program and the training, that's another, um, I think, underappreciated, undervalued training that is there for all of us to, 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 to discuss and to be part of. I also oversee, in the state of Arizona, our emergency management. And with that being said, the value of having that emergency management, that unified command structure is, the, is paramount to what we call in Arizona the level one uh, closures, which is those, those closures that are full closures on our, our, on our interstates and that cause the DOT directors, superintendents to give me calls wondering what's going on and when this is going to be cleared up. Um, we also have implemented um, the uh, after actions, and we've put a performance measure on that. Uh, as you all know, it's difficult to bring parties together sometimes because everybody's busy. You know, there's always something going on every single day, but we try our, our hardest to keep that to seven days or less in bringing the team back together and, and, and debriefing or on that after action. And we also um, um, put that public and make, make sure that people are aware of what kind of uh, uh, discussions went on and training that might be needed. goes back to uh, radios, is, is the communications, and it's difficult sometimes. And as, as COVID has hit all of us, the COVID-19 budgets of, of all of us have been reduced, and, 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 but yet our volumes have gone down. In, in Phoenix, I know our, our, vo our volumes have gone down significantly. So have our incidents. But we're still out there doing what we need to do. Um, I, uh, I also wanted to talk just briefly on um, what's called the Integrated Corridor manage, Management. We have a grant, a uh, federal grant through FHWA, that uh, Phoenix is continuing to grow, as many of your uh, metropolitan areas are as well. And there's, there's a need for all of it, has been for many, many years, for all of us to kind of be on that same page. And um, when we talk about integrated corridor management from a law enforcement standpoint and a DOT standpoint, uh, that's sometimes, uh, you know, I heard someone say something that, hey, we don't know about uh, the detours, we know about this. Each one of us knows our own uh, standard of what needs to be done in our, in our own way. But we're working hard with the different municipalities throughout the metropolitan area, bringing people together. Um, what hasn't happened yet, which I think is necessary, is for the political entities to meet. I don't know if that will ever happen, but mayors, uh, city managers need to be part of this because we can bring the boots on the ground, the traffic uh, control, the law enforcement, the fire personnel, EMS, towing, all of those entities, uh, signal, signal people, timing. But uh, what happens is, who controls that? Well, 
since I oversee a state operation, it's kind of gone to me through our traffic operations center, which I also oversee. And how is that going to, how are we going to do that? And I can tell you that it's still a work in progress. We have meetings uh, about every other week, but we're trying to bring uh, the full uh, gamut of uh, all of us working together under one umbrella, if you will, um, to reduce uh, you know, the queuing and reduce the, the overall effect, ill effect, if you will, of when these crashes, when these incidents occur, uh, what's going to happen in a Scottsdale or a Chandler or a Mesa or a Phoenix or out west, a Peoria or a Su Surprise or any other affected area that on the interstate or on one of our state highways, uh, the freeway system, um, when we divert traffic. And uh, that's still a work in progress, but again, it goes back to those opportunities in law enforcement to have those key people at the table. Um, we have the quick, quick clearance laws and the push, pull, and drag policies um, instituted with our ADOT, also with our Department of Public Safety on the state patrol side. Quick clearance, the expectation through ongoing meetings with our state police is that if there's no one injured, or if there's nobody that if there's no observable crime that has been committed, we will push, pull, or drag that vehicle off. And that's kind of a I know that each state does it differently and I would encourage any of you to, to understand what your laws are associated to that um, on quick clearance and what the public's obligations are um, and on the push pull or drag with an internal policy. Uh, the Good Samaritan laws, those kinds of things apply. We got it legislatively uh, adopted now to where none of our DOT personnel uh, are subjected to uh, lawsuits or civil tort because of uh, their actions or inactions for that matter. But uh, those are things that are important. I, uh, let's see, I think I've gone through my notes. Um, but I recognize the value of, of law enforcement. I understand that uh, now wearing a different hat and having been um, in law enforcement for so many years that uh, sometimes law enforcement sees it just a one-sided thing. They're so quick to get in and, and solve the problem, so quick to get in and get that crime scene established um, that sometimes we forget. And I say law enforcement forgets to remember that there's a long line of of people that are upset that are calling their political, uh, you know, representatives who then escalate that uh, and it quickly becomes something that I think might be able to be detoured or at least uh, impacted less if our, our uh, relationships improve. And I think they are overall. I see in Arizona that we still have a, a bunch of work in, in progress and, and a lot of work in the future to move forward with. but. Having said that, um, I hope that what I've said today might be helpful. Um, if you have any questions, I can always be available. But uh, just want to thank you guys for what you do. And I recognize now more than ever, having been here now for almost four years, the value of, uh, of, of uh, the traffic incident management and all the players associated to this. Um, the safety service patrols are an incredible resource to every state. And, and I hope that. Um, through the downturn maybe in the economy and, and budgets that um, that the performance measures will we'll be able to, to speak to those and identify the value that it produces for the motoring public and ultimately um, the safety that it gives to our, 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 uh, our first responders. So thank you guys. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Derek. Uh, very good stuff. Any questions for uh, Anything for Derek or any of the speakers? A lot. I see your your comments there. Uh, we'll get to you and see see if anybody else answers or, or has any questions. You want to go ahead, Ladder? Yeah, just uh, an observation. I had actually had the uh, privilege or punishment, depending on how you want to look at, it, to come up I ninety five yesterday. And uh, when I came through Virginia, I came across two separate minor accidents. Um, the one Safety Service Patrol pulled up behind, you know, they put up their aeroboard, they put out all their cones and everything, and 
traffic was backed up for probably about 10 miles before we got to them just because of what was going on there in the left-hand shoulder. They weren't actually affecting the lanes of travel at all. It was just pure rubbernecking. Um, Another 10 miles up the road was a very similar crash, but the trooper had apparently directed everyone to pull up into a crossover in between the northbound and the southbound side, and nobody paid attention to them. You know, they were they were off the road. They weren't affecting the flow of traffic. Um, it was just something that I saw. It stuck out with me, and maybe it's something you guys could try to disseminate down to, you know, all your other patrols is, you know, getting off the shoulder is great, but if you can get them to an exit or a crossover where you know they're they're further away from traffic, they're less likely to cause any disruptions, and you know also much less likely to get hit just because they're further away from the flow of traffic. Yeah, very, very good point. You know, get them off the road, get them out of the way. Um, Lacey, I see you're typing something, and Derek uh, also typing something. Uh, uh, I definitely think, you know, uh, you know, working together, you, you know, we, we heard the key points here of, you know, teamwork, communications, getting to know each other, and it, it's something that we need to make sure that we keep doing. Uh, Jack Sullivan, are you still on the call? Uh, Jack, if you are, I was going to ask you if you wanted to say a few words about respondersafety.com. Uh, and uh, some of the things that we're working on, uh, if, if you feel like it. Uh. All right, Todd, can you hear me? Yep, yes, I can, Jack, thanks. All right, no problem, I'd be glad to jump in. I, I think uh, the only thing I'd add for this group is that uh, a week or two ago, John Sullivan down in Tennessee on the help team down there had started writing an article for us about debris removal for safety service patrols. Uh, he finished that article and sent it to me on Friday. And uh, of course we had the line of duty death for the uh, motorist assist volunteer uh, about the same time. So John went back and redid the uh, article and uh, noted that line of duty death and um, reposted it. And we just dropped it on the website today put out a couple of social media posts on it, but debris removal is one of the areas that we've seen consistently over the last 10 years where we've had injuries, uh, struck by property damage on safety service patrol vehicles, and of course, fatalities also. Um, I wanna make sure that people are aware that article was out there. This might be a good time in an after action review type of environment to go over your procedures and your training for debris removal in light of the uh, recent line of duty death and just make it a point to refresh everybody's mind on approaching this in a team effort. And uh, Todd, that's all I've got. Thanks, Jack. Uh, for anyone that's uh, on this call that has some uh, traffic management centers or TOC responsibilities, one of the modules that we recently launched on respondersafety.com has to deal with Tim for the TOC operator. I, I think it's a very good module, not just got, because I helped uh, work on it, but I, I think that there's a lot that can be learned by a, a TOC person uh, from this and really from any traffic operations person. Uh, so it's worth checking out. Again, it, it's free, high-quality training, uh, so it, it, it's def something that's definitely worthwhile. Uh, John Sullivan's also, also on this uh, webinar. John, did you want to say anything? All right, he may be having trouble getting off mute or uh, maybe shy. I don't think he's shy, so yep. maybe a mute issue. Uh, anybody have any questions? I think our presenters did an excellent job today. I, I really appreciate them uh, sharing uh, their information. John, were you trying to say something? Okay. Uh, so we'll start winding up, but we're a little bit ahead of schedule. Does anybody have anything they want to mention or bring up uh, related to safety service patrol? Is anybody doing anything uh, different, unusual, uh, 
groundbreaking that you'd like to share? Okay, well, we'll, we'll then wrap it up. We'll, we'll, uh, I appreciate every time. Uh, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Lauren to wrap us up then. Thank you, Todd. So as many of you know, we do host these sessions throughout the year. So our next session is planned to be coming this fall. On the bottom of your screen, we have a polling survey asking you for your input on what you would like the topic for the next session to be. There are a couple options there. If you have an idea for another topic, um, you can select other and then put your response into the chat box. As Sam mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, there's a lot of resources that we've added to safehighways.org. In addition to the copy of this presentation, you can also find some additional resources, including the uh, previous session recaps and recordings, the COVID-19 recap and supporting documents that Sam and Scott Yinger touched upon in the beginning. And we also have a national SSP chart and survey, which we would kindly ask that you please update with your patrol data. If you have any questions or would like to be added to the mailing list, you can do so by emailing ssp at safehighways.org. We also encourage if you would like to present in future sessions, you can also email us there, and we can um, coordinate to see if there's a session that uh, meets with the topic of your choice. That being said, I want to just extend a thank you to all of our presenters today. Did an awesome job. And also just want to thank everyone for taking the time to join our join today's session. And that being said, that concludes the SSP Idea Sharing Network working with other emergency responders. Thank you, everyone. One Lauren, one more thing. You're going to send out the average review, correct? Yes. I will also add um, I will also send out the after action review. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, David, thank you for the reminder. I, I just saw your, your thing pop up, so I appreciate it. Perfect. Thank you. And we'll put the topic polling question up on the screen for the remainder of the call. Um, we do encourage everyone to you know, place your input. We do value that in choosing the topics for our sessions.